The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals presents the timeless teaching of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. There are three verbs in this section of the epistle which center in the will and choice of the individual believer. Now in these three verbs and their sequence, we have a plan of battle which has been drawn up by the Lord himself for our Christian living. We are to accept his word about our union with Christ in his death, thus reckoning or counting ourselves to be dead unto sin. We are to stand in active opposition to the reign of sin in our bodies, and we are to yield ourselves unto the obedience of righteousness. Over a half a century ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, then pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, saw the need to spread God's word beyond the hearing of his local congregation. He started the radio outreach, which has become known as Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible. The application of God's word as taught by Dr. Barnhouse is as relevant today as when he first taught over the radio airwaves decades ago. The message we will be featuring on today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is entitled, Choose Your Master. Choosing a job is one of the most important decisions you can make. You want an employer who will treat you well and provide the greatest benefit for you. A believer may choose the way of sin and reap terrible consequences. He may choose the bondage of pursuing a relationship with God based on keeping the law or he can choose the blessed life of daily joyful submission to the Lord. Which master do you choose to follow? The scripture text for today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 6 and verse 15. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Choose Your Master. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy patient tenderness with us, for the way thou dost bear with our infirmities, our weaknesses, our murmurings, our waverings, our sins. Bless the going forth of thy word in this hour and use it to thy glory in each listening heart. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're speaking on Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? God forbid. Now the sixth chapter opened with a question that is somewhat similar to the one that we find in our text. But on close examination, we will discover that the two questions are different and have different answers. The first question asked if the Christian would continue in sin in order to make God's grace abound. This thought was pushed away with horror. There is no lawlessness in the Christian's relationship to God. The second question asks, if we are to sin because we are not under law, but under grace. This idea will be repudiated with equal horror, and the true path of the believer will be shown to be a delightful yieldedness to the Lord rather than a bondage to any set of rules, however ethical. The inward nature of sin is a desire for independence. When Lucifer sinned, it was with the desire to replace God by himself. It was not a request to share the throne of the universe. It was a bold attempt to replace the Lord God and to be like the Most High God who is the possessor of heaven and earth. When Adam sinned, it was the deliberate rebellion of the creature against the Creator. It was a declaration of independence. Adam had been given everything in creation with the exception of one tree and its fruit. And when he reached forth his hand to take it, he was saying by that act, I'm tired of possessing everything else if I cannot have this one thing. I do not want this symbol of dependence. I want to be independent. Now, by declaring his independence, he became a slave of sin. 
not having known in advance the result of departure from God. Seeking independence from God, he became a slave, a slave of sin. We who have found salvation in Christ have given up our independence in order to become dependent upon him, and thereby we have received the utmost in liberty and a freedom that is divine. We have learned the joy of this dependence, for it has given us the independence of being free within the limits of the divine perfection. The first act of our salvation is a complete reversal of the position which Adam sought and found. He put out his hand and took the fruit of a tree which he thought would lead to independence, but which in reality led to the slavery of sin. We, by faith, put out our hand to the tree of life, the cross of Jesus Christ, and take from that tree the fruit of salvation, which he has purchased there for us. We thereby eat of that tree and live forever. But that tree is a tree of dependence, which leads us to the slavery of righteousness. That slavery is the slavery of grace. It is the bondage of joy. It is the constraint of love. It is the enthrallment of peace. It is the yoke of Christ. The key to the whole matter of triumph is now revealed as a technique of surrender. The preposterous question is answered by a self-evident reply. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? This should not take much argument to cause the mind to accept it as a plain fact. A young man in the United States who, from whatever cause, has become a fellow traveler and accepted a card as a dues-paying member in the Communist Party has become a slave of that system. There have been men who have gone this way of slavery to the point of total betrayal of their country. There have been others, like Whitaker Chambers, who have made the about face that is necessary to break that bondage. Chambers once yielded himself to the communists and was their slave. When he broke with that slavery and yielded himself to the forces of democracy, he became a servant of democracy. Now, the clashing sovereignties of communism and democracy are not nearly as far apart as the powers of law and grace. Now, what shall we do, says our text? Shall we go on sinning because we have no law to condemn us anymore, but are living under grace? Never. Just think what it would mean. You belong to the power which you choose to obey. Whether you choose sin, whose reward is death, or God, obedience to whom means the reward of righteousness. Now, in the example of forms of government, there are others beside the two which have been set forth as principal contenders. But in the things of life and death, there are only two masters, God and self. If we yield ourselves to the Lord to serve him, we become his bond slaves. If we do not, we are thereby yielding to ourselves which means delivering ourselves over to the service of sin and thereby becoming sin's a slave. The whole of the gospel message centers around the fact that God has given unto us salvation, which includes deliverance. We could not serve the Lord when we were slaves of sin, but he has now made it possible for us to have life and to have it more abundantly. This abundant life brings with it the possibility of yieldedness to the Lord himself. And it is this yieldedness which brings all the wedding joys to the Christian life. The emphasis at this point is upon the act of the will on the part of the believer. In his regeneration, he has received new life in Christ, and that life includes a will. Before his salvation, he was dead in trespasses and sin, and his salvation could not in any wise be dependent upon his will. As we read in the first of John, we are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And as Paul writes to the Romans in the ninth chapter, salvation is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Indeed, it's flatly stated elsewhere that the unregenerate man is carried captive by Satan according to his, Satan's will, and that the totality of the unsaved lie in the embrace of the wicked one. But... When we are quickened in Christ, 
we have restored to us the image that was lost in the fall and are now able with our new natures to make choices. This is the secret of the life of holiness. We are now brought to the place where the power of the risen Lord can dominate us. The power has been given to Christ in the resurrection. As he said, all power is given unto me and has been communicated to us by the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord Jesus said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. There are three verbs in this section of the epistle which center in the will and choice of the individual believer. In the 11th verse of the 6th chapter, we're told to reckon ourselves dead unto sin and alive unto God. In the 12th verse, we're commanded to forbid the reign of sin in our mortal bodies. And in the 16th verse, we're instructed to yield ourselves in obedience unto righteousness. Now, in these three verbs and their sequence, we have a plan of battle which has been drawn up by the Lord himself for our Christian living. We are to accept his word about our union with Christ in his death, thus reckoning or counting ourselves to be dead unto sin. We are to stand in active opposition to the reign of sin in our bodies, and we are to yield ourselves unto the obedience of righteousness. If these three things are examined closely, it will be seen that each is the acceptance by faith of a divine principle. We simply believe God's word about our union with Christ. We act by faith on the work that was done. We accept by faith the divine principles, and we yield ourselves by faith to that obedience of righteousness. Thomas says that these verses contain the key words of holiness. To reckon ourselves dead unto sin and alive unto God is an attitude of faith, not of feeling. It's a calculation based on facts and may perhaps be described as mathematical rather than emotional. Faith is to conclude about ourselves what God has declared about us. God reckons us to have died with Christ. We are therefore to keep on reckoning ourselves to have died and to have risen with him. When Christ died, we died. When he rose, we rose. We are to keep on reckoning these facts as absolutely true. And then as we reckon them, they will become powerful in our lives. For we become what we reckon ourselves to be. When sin makes its appeal, we must refuse to recognize it by reckoning that we died to it in Christ. And at once it will go, its power broken. In the same way, when we long to be holy, we simply reckon that we are alive to God in Christ. And as we reckon this to be true, the power of God's grace will flood our souls. Then we shall see that the Christian life is not a constant battle, but a constant victory. Not to let sin reign follows as a consequence from the foregoing. And the present tense of the verb is especially noteworthy. It implies a continuous and a continuing attitude and action of the believer. Because of our oneness with Christ in his death and life, we are not for an instant to allow any dominion of sin in our being. If it were possible so to render the words, we should say, keep on not allowing sin to be king in your mortal body. Herein lies our personal responsibility. Because of what Christ is, we are not to allow sin to be our Lord. Present, yield, is the third of the words. And this is the other side of truth. Negatively, we are not to allow sin to be our master. Positively, we are to present ourselves to God for his use and service. The tenses of the verb are striking in this instance also. Do not keep on presenting your members as weapons of unrighteousness to sin, but once for all present yourselves to God as those who are living from the dead and your members as weapons of righteousness for God. It is the presentation of ourselves, the deliberate choice based upon our position in Christ Jesus in order that we may be used of God and serve him daily in righteousness and true holiness. The practical daily and even momentary use of each of these three key words will give us the secret of perpetual holiness. Our text now shows us that we are all slaves 
but we have a right to choose our master. What we do henceforth will depend on the master which we choose. Once we have chosen, we must, of course, obey. Paul takes it for granted that those to whom he writes, for from the very first verse of the epistle, he has been addressing believers only. He takes it for granted, I say, that they have made the choice, have been joined to Christ, and therefore must understand their position as bond slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. He even thanks God in the next verse that though they had been slaves of sin in the past, they were now bond slaves of righteousness. Now, having seen the three key words of holiness from the human point of view, we are now presented with the same truth from the divine point of view. And there is the startling promise. Startling because it is so absolute, so complete, that sin shall not have dominion over us. Following this, there is the expression of the principle that underlies such a positive statement. The reason that such a declaration is possible is that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. When we have read this section over again and again, we begin to sense some of the feeling that has laid hold upon the apostle. He is bringing forth this section of the epistle in acute labor pains. Here's an illustration of the attitude which Paul had when he wrote to the Galatians, My little children, with whom I am again in travail, until Christ be formed in you. He has such an earnest desire that the young church should learn to live in holiness. He had presented the doctrine of justification in chapters 3 to 5, as it is presented nowhere else in the word of God. And now he, he wants them to realize that while justification is not sanctification, yet nevertheless sanctification is inseparably fused with justification and must result from it. The two are like Siamese twins, which have a common bloodstream. The line of sanctification flows out of justification. Having shown the principle on which sanctification rests, union with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, he now sets forth the practicality of sanctification and brings it down to the level of every Christian. Holiness is no longer something remotely desirable, but something that is attainable, especially in the light of what we might call a constitutional change, that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. He has shown that it is a horrible thing to entertain the thought that we could continue in sin in order to bring forth the abounding supplies of grace. He now shows that the same horror is inherent in the idea of sinning, because grace does abound. The difference between the two questions is the difference between the state of sin and the practice of sins. The one is, shall we continue in sin? The other is, shall we continue to sin? He's leading up to the doctrine of practical holiness under grace. When we analyze our text, we see that the reason why we are not to sin is that we are not under the law, but under grace. We have seen that under law means to be governed by law, as the principle of an agreement or covenant established by God on the basis of works. Law demands what it is powerless to provide. Being under law, therefore, places the individual under a system that demands the perfect fulfillment of all the terms of the agreement. If he lives up to the terms of the agreement, he is to receive a reward from God, which will be his because he has earned it. If he fails to live up to the terms of that agreement, he must then suffer the penalty which is his because he fell short of the agreement. The situation of any individual under law, therefore, is a state of being cursed or being in death. Being under grace, on the contrary, makes possible for the recipient all that the law demanded but could not provide. Being under grace takes us from the control of the justice of God and puts us under the love of God. Being under grace places us in the position of partakers of the divine nature and gives us freely the strength for the inner man, making it possible for us to obey the righteousness of God. The contrast between these two positions shows, therefore, how absurd are the claims of those who ignorantly teach that the doctrine of grace will make it easy for believers to sin 
As several different translators have put it, God forbid, certainly not, not at all, by no means. What a ghastly thought, never. Paul concludes this portion of the argument with the expansion of the thought which had been made earlier by the Lord Jesus himself. For the Savior had said, No man can serve two masters. They had been under the yoke of the flesh. The coming of the gospel brought them the great invitation, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This was the yoke that he offered to them. I have read in many commentaries the idea that Christ was speaking of the yoke such as that which was used for animals, the yoke of oxen. But most certainly he was not talking on that level. These people understood the symbolism of the yoke. For Rome, when they won a battle, forced all of the conquered to stoop under their yoke. And to take the yoke meant to acknowledge the bondage of the Roman Empire. The yoke was the symbol of slavery. Israel understood what this meant, for they had passed under the Roman yoke and had been subjugated. Even though they said to Jesus Christ, we have never been slaves to any man, they lied when they said it. They had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They had been slaves to the Philistines on several occasions. They had been slaves in Babylon. They had been slaves under Alexander the Great and now they were slaves under the Roman Empire. But they wanted to keep up the pretense of liberty. And Jesus had to say, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. For freedom and liberty are matters of the mind and not of the body. The Lord is offering them another yoke, his own. Half the people in the world were slaves at the moment he spoke. They understood full well the significance of that which he was saying. And when the thought is expressed in our text... It is the announcement that the slave has found a new master. The slaves of Rome had heard a thousand conversations concerning the natures of their masters and the treatment which they received. They would have understood the difference between the character of Simon Legree and that of Augustine St. Clair in the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin. They knew the difference between the master with the cruel lash and the master with the kind heart. And the difference between the mastery of sin and the mastery of grace was the difference between night and day. For now the despot gives way to the Lord. Tyranny is succeeded by love. Defeat is wiped away in triumph. Death is swallowed up in victory. Just think what that means. You belong to the power which you choose to obey. Whether you choose sin whose reward is death or God, obedience to whom means the reward of righteousness. It is perhaps in order at this point that the strongest possible appeal be made to every individual who hears these words. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you are, of course, whether you will or no, the slave of sin and the child of wrath. It makes no difference how high morally and ethically you may have risen in that family of slaves. The fact of the servitude is certain. To you the appeal comes to accept and acknowledge your lost condition and cast yourself on the grace of God, believing that Christ took your place on the cross in order to redeem you from your bondage and introduce you into the glorious liberty of the children of God. But if, on the other hand, you do know Christ as your personal Savior, then consider the obligations of holiness, which go with your high position, and lay hold upon the means which he has provided for your growth in holiness. Let there be no swerving from the decision. Let there be no satisfaction with anything short of that which the Lord has provided for you. Enter into the land and possess the possessions which he provided for you at such a cost. And our God and Father, we pray thee for each listener in this hour. If there should be any who have not been born again, we ask thee to give them restlessness that they may know no peace until they rest in Christ. But upon all thy believing own, who've truly been born again, may thy grace, thy mercy, and thy peace abide, and a new sense of the obligation of holiness that is demanded by our mastery 
Satan, and unto thee be the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power, now, until our Lord Jesus come again and forever. Amen. Many people foolishly choose the path of independence from God and disobedience to His Word. Do you submit to Jesus Christ as your Master and enjoy the blessedness of His fellowship? We hope you have benefited from today's message by Dr. Barnhouse entitled, Choose Your Master. You can listen to additional Bible teaching by the late Donald Gray Barnhouse via the Internet by visiting the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals at AllianceNet.org. An audio copy of today's teaching is available by calling us toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Today's message again is entitled, Choose Your Master, or simply request message number R6-34. We'd also like to make available to you a free copy of our booklet entitled, The Gospel We Like to Hear. The Bible warns us against following teachers who will tickle our ears with false doctrines that appeal to our fleshly nature. This free booklet clearly sets forth the true biblical gospel and sounds a warning against ear-tickling, people-pleasing distortions of the good news, including the false religions of signs and wonders, salvation without lordship, and the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Ask for your free copy of The Gospel We Like to Hear when you call or write. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is a radio ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We exist to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching materials which will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible comes to you through the generous gifts of our listeners. If you have benefited from the broadcast and would like it to continue, please prayerfully consider a donation to help us keep this ministry on the air. For more information or to make a contribution to support and further our work, please contact us by writing Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Call toll-free 1-800-488-1888 or visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Be sure to ask for a free updated resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, daily devotionals, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians, including Donald Gray Barnhouse, James Montgomery Boyce, Michael Horton, and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then join us again next time for more classic teaching on Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible.